Welcome everyone to my talk about generic authenticated key exchange in the quantum random oracle model. Uh, this was joint work with Eike Kils, Sven Schiege and Dominic Ungro. The context of this work is the so-called NIST competition, which aims to find standards for quantum secure public key encryption, key exchange and signatures. So first I'll say a few words about public key encryption. And the level of security NIST is aiming for is active security, which we also know as CCA security. But uh, what is way easier to achieve is passive security like one-wayness or uh, indistinguishability under chosen plain text attacks. And uh, yeah, what we usually do is to construct a scheme that is passively secure and then to turn it into something that's actively secure by applying the well-known Fujisaki Okamoto transformation and its modern CAM variants. A major technical problem in applying the Fujisaki Okamoto transformation is the probability of decryption failure. So most lattice-based schemes come with a small probability of decryption failure, meaning that with some small probability encrypting and then decrypting does not result in the original message. So this has to be taken care of and I'll say a bit more uh, later in the talk. Moving on to key exchange. So we quantum stuff was kind of easy. We could use Diffie-Hellman key exchange and uh, authentication, for example, via signatures or camps. Post-quantum, the situation is a bit different. Uh, Diffie-Hellman is broken. And our known constructions for quantum signatures are still quite costly, so we would like to do without them. And to, just to avoid confusion, uh, of course, any public key primitive requires a working public key infrastructure. And the latter, of course, requ uh, requires signatures to certify the public key. But the certificate uh, only has to be verified once and for all, meaning that using signatures to set up the infrastructure only adds negligible overhead. So this is not an issue. But during protocol execution, we want to do without signatures. So there already has been work on authenticating key exchange without signature. In 2008, uh, Boyd et al. gave a chem to AKE construction. In fact, they gave two constructions achieving different levels of security. Uh, the first protocol was relatively weak because exposed randomness breaks the level of security. And um, to, to strengthen this protocol to be resilient against this kind of attack, a session-specific Diffie-Hellman layer was added, meaning that uh, this construction is not suitable for post-quantum security. There was also work by Fuyuka et al. in 2012, and they um, extended the um, the framework of Boyd by also adding a session specific layer, but uh, instead of working with a Diffie Hellman layer, they just used any passively secure CAM. So this was more generic. And uh, also working with an additional twisted PRF trick, they were able to achieve resistance against exposure of secret data. However, they assumed the underlying scheme to be perfectly correct. And I already mentioned that this might turn out to be an issue and I will discuss it later. Uh, another minor issue is that uh, the, the Fujisaki Okamoto transform already involves hashing the key and the construction by Fuyuka et al. involves more potentially redundant hashing of the already hashed session key. So in conclusion, there were no known chem to key exchange constructions uh, coming with guaranteed post-quantum security in the presence of potential decryption failure. Hence, the goal of our work was to give a simplified transformation that is secure against quantum adversaries, 
even if the underlying scheme is not perfectly correct, and that also gets rid of unnecessary hashing steps. And we achieved this goal by uh, lifting the Fujisaki Okamoto transformation to the AKE setting, meaning that we can now turn any passively secure PKE scheme into a post-quantum secure authenticated key exchange. And an example uh, of how to apply this work uh, can be seen in the Kyber key exchange. Given that I already hinted at the fact that our AKE result can be seen as an extension of our uh, Fujisaki Okamoto CAM results, and since the uh, authenticated key exchange protocol draws on recent research on its CAM counterpart so heavily, I will provide you with some background on Fujisaki Okamoto like CAMs first. Afterwards, I provide some intuition on the security level we are aiming for with our key exchange protocol. And finally, I present our protocol and some open questions that I find quite interesting. As a warm up, I do a quick recap with regards to the Fujisaki Okamoto transformation. The original work was found to have some limitations when it comes to post quantum security, and those limitations inspired a lot of follow up research. And um, the first limitation I want to mention is that the original work needed the underlying scheme to be perfectly correct. That is, first encrypting and then decrypting always results in the original message. But what I would like to point out is that uh, many lattice-based encryption schemes that were proposed for the NIST competition uh, actually come with a uh, with a probability of decryption failure, and um, known examples are Kaiba, Frodo, or New Hope. And what we found out in 2017 is that even a negligible probability of decryption failure might affect this, uh, the security level. To say a bit more about this issue, so intuitively one might think that a negligible probability should be a negligible issue. But an active attacker can query the decapsulation oracle on any ciphertext it wishes. And um, that means that neither the message nor the encryption randomness have to be drawn uniformly at random, which was how failure probability used to be defined at first. In particular, this means that an attacker can try to deliberately trigger decryption uh, failure. And if the failure depends on the secret key that is used, then the fact that failure occurred alone already leaks secret information. So um, to point out how this indeed seems to be an issue, I want to refer to the attack described in the work of Denver et al. in 2018. What they do is that they first obtain a list of failing ciphertexts, and then they estimate the secret based on these ciphertexts. Luckily, the NIST proposals pick the parameters conservatively enough to render the attack impractical, but nonetheless, I wanted to stress that even uh, such a negligible probability of decryption failure can indeed affect the security. Okay, so how do we cope with this situation? One possible solution would be to only build schemes with perfect correctness, but first of all, it's quite costly because uh, while lattice-based encryption schemes can be made perfectly correct by putting a limit on the noise and setting the modulus large enough, increasing the size of the modulus makes the problem easier to solve in practice. So the dimension of the problem needs to be increased in order to obtain the same security levels, which then in turn leads to greater public key and ciphertext length. And also, many NIST submissions deliberately made the design choice of having imperfect correctness, and those would not be covered by uh, any analysis that does not deal with non-perfect correctness. So from my point of view, the better solution would be to give proofs that deal with non-perfect correctness. Okay, now that we've talked about decryption failure, there was another limitation. The original proof was in the random oracle model, which does not account for adversaries with quantum capabilities. And uh, I now sketch a bit what changes if our attacker actually does come with quantum capabilities. So 
So the random oracle model is a proof heuristic in which we replace the hash function with a perfectly random function h. And the common proof strategy we are using in our FO uh, security proofs is to claim that if A can distinguish a particular hash value from random, the reduction must learn the pre-image x, uh, x star, and this x star might solve the underlying problem. Our FO example would be that learning the message m star would imply that we are able to invert a ciphertext. What changes if A is quantum? The scenario we are considering here is that a quantum adversary is still interacting with a non-quantum network. And this means that online primitives like decryption or signing stay classical, but offline primitives like hash functions that the adversary can compute on its own are now computable in superposition. So what's new? The adversary can evaluate the hash function on some superposition and if you are not super assured that you know what that is, just imagine it to be a linear combination of uh, all possible inputs. So furthermore, the possibility of A pulling quantum tricks leads to more complicated proofs. An example for this is uh, how to extract a particular pre-image from the Oracle queries, because now uh, a particular pre-image is hidden somewhere within this superposition, within this linear combination. Okay, so here we see our typical random until query argument, and we uh, state that the probability of A distinguishing the hash value from random is upper bounded by the probability of A querying the random oracle or next star. So this is still the classical setting. What changes if our attacker is quantum is the following. We get a factor of Q that goes into the upper bound, where Q is the number of queries to the random oracle. And we also get a square root above a probability. And the probability isn't uh, any longer the probability of A querying the random oracle on the pre-image. Instead, it's the probability that measuring a random query uh, gives us the pre-image. So we can already see that this upper bound is uh, quite far from the upper bound we had in the classical setting. And uh, while there have been some recent improvements, um, they all come with some additional technical restrictions. So, so they are not just uh, drop-in replacements for what we had before. So now that I hopefully convinced you that correctness errors and quantum attackers are indeed an issue, it comes as no surprise that there has been a lot of research invested in the FO transformation and the quantum random oracle model within the last years. And I try to um, gather up some common grounds that all the uh, recent results share. So. Um, what our results have in common is that they dissect the FO transformation into two simpler transformations, and then they give security statements for those two steps. The first step usually is called transformation T, and it's used to de-randomize the underlying scheme, and I'll show you in a second how this works. And the second step is a hashing step that turns the intermediate PKE scheme that we achieved by de-randomization into a CAM that is actively secure. So to give a quick reminder on how the T-transform looks like, it's essentially the encrypt with hash construction, meaning that we make the encryption scheme deterministic by using the hash of the message as the encryption randomness. For the second transformation, we take the intermediate encryption scheme and encapsulation works as follows. We choose a uniformly random plain text M. 
We use the underlying encryption schemes encryption algorithm to encrypt it to a ciphertext C. And we derive the key by computing the hash of the message and the ciphertext. In the decapsulation algorithm, we first use the underlying decryption algorithm to uh, get back to uh, the plain text M, or possibly M prime if decryption fails. If um, the decryption algorithm rejects, we will also reject, and otherwise we compute the key as above. Mm, in a sense, I lied a bit to you, because uh, actually there are many different variants of the U-transform that have been considered within the last years. So for example, you might want to derive the key by only hashing the message. Or you could uh, go for implicit reject, meaning that instead of returning the failure symbol, if the decryption didn't work, you will uh, return a pseudorandom value that is derived from the message. What all recent results have in common is that at least one of the two proofs runs into the quantum extraction problem I mentioned before. And um, now I discuss a bit why there has been ongoing work and uh, why we are still trying to improve the CCA bounds. So our goal would be to tightly relate the FO claim security to that of the underlying scheme. By tightness, I mean that the derived scheme can be proven as secure as the underlying building block. And with less tight results, I mean that the derived scheme security can be related to the weaker building block in a less immediate manner. And we'll see an example in two clicks. Uh, if the relation is to lose, the security statement for our derived scheme could turn out to be meaningless, meaning that we would have to make the underlying problem harder, but that would mean that we would have to scale up the underlying scheme's parameters, and that would make it less efficient. So whenever it is possible, we want to give a proof that is, well, as tight as possible. So first, here's some wishful thinking. What we would like would be to um, give a CCA bond that is simply the CPA advantage of the underlying scheme, because this is achieved in the random, random oracle model. So if we don't have to assume quantum attackers, we are very, very tight. In this work, we achieve an upper bound that still comes with a square root and also a factor of Q. Q is the number of quantum random oracle queries. And intuitively, the last tight bound is because we need to use a quantum pre-image extraction strategy. And we already have seen how those come with a factor of Q and a square root. Mm. Still, I should mention that the bound we see here might not be great, but we already made some progress compared to the bounds in 2017, in which we had nested roots. So last year, we made progress in two regards. We could uh, reduce the underlying security notion uh, towards one-wayness instead of CPA security. And for deterministic schemes, we could show how to get rid of the factor Q. And why does this work? Because if the underlying encryption scheme is already deterministic, we don't have to apply the T-transform and it's sufficient to apply the second step, the U-transform. And uh, this work also gave a new bound for our quantum extraction problem. Uh, this year during Eurocrypt, a really nice new result was presented that got rid of the square root altogether. So what we see here is that for deterministic schemes, we only have the factor of Q that disturbs our tightness. And for CPA, we have a quadratic uh, factor of Q. And uh, these tighter bounds are achieved by a new quantum extraction technique that's called measure rewind measure. Uh, what I should mention is that this comparison comes with a huge caveat. 
Um, those results are for different variants, uh, like on the use slide you have seen, you can derive your key in different ways and so on. And also they might need some additional requirements and uh, way more details are given in another talk that is to be found in this link. To proceed to authenticated key exchange, I first uh, explain our uh, security model a bit. So we are in the lucky setting that we are only considering two move protocols, meaning that only two messages are exchanged between Alice and Bob, which makes everything a bit more easy. And the goal we are aiming for is first of all correctness, meaning that both uh, parties will derive the same key with overwhelming probability, and secondly, key indistinguishability. So from the outside, it should look as if the key would be completely random. In practice, there exist many ways to attack the key indistinguishability. So for example, uh, one could try to learn session keys of uh, sessions that have already been established. One could try to corrupt a user and thereby learn the secret key of the user that was attacked or even the secret key of both involved parties. One could try to learn the session state or the randomness it used. And uh, one could also try to actively interfere with the protocol by modifying the exchanged messages. And there exist many different security models that come with subtle differences in how um, those uh, attacks are modeled but going into the details would be way beyond the scope of this uh, of this talk. So for this talk, I only point out what kind of security we are aiming for. As I already said, we are in the lucky situation that we only consider two move protocols, meaning that it is easy to dissect the whole protocol into three simple steps. And in particular, it turned out to be relatively easy to define our security model in pseudocode. We have already seen that the attack surface for key exchange is pretty broad and yeah, going into details here would go beyond the scope of this work. But for viewers that know and care about AKE, I wanted to include a list of attacks that our model covers. For our security proof, we are using a slightly weaker variant of the model above. So what we disallow is to do a state reveal on the test session if it is an initiator session and the adversary actively interferes with the protocol by changing an exchanged message. Uh, this only affects the initiator session because a responder holds no states anyways for two move protocols. And it only affects the time interval between sending and receiving the message. While an uh, active attacker may increase the interval by withholding messages and delaying their arrival, uh, in real world implementations, there is some a restriction on this interval because uh, messages cannot be delayed too heavily as otherwise the initiator will abort assuming that the receiver cannot be reached. Yeah, and our slightly weaker variant is essentially the notion of the work that I discussed when I mentioned CAM2 AKE constructions uh, that have been given before. In the last technical part of the talk, I now show you how we can extend the Fujisaki Okamoto strategy to the key exchange setting. Recall that we are aiming for both authentication and key indistinguishability. And our strategy will be to, uh, to use a multi-user variant of Fujisaki Okamoto. What, do I, uh, what I mean by that is that we exchange FO-like ciphertexts. By this, I mean ciphertexts that are built, 
that are built according to the T-transform. So both partners pick some random messages and use the T-transform to encrypt it using the partner's public key. And key computation will be a multi-user variant of the U-transform. Uh, but since we are now in the multi-user setting, we have to hash the whole transcript, which also means that we have to include the public keys of the communicating partners in the hash. But that's not really the whole story because we are also aiming for a weak perfect forward secrecy and to include in every session some freshness. Uh, what we'll do is to add some session specific or ephemeral FO communication. By that I mean that Alice has to pick a new key pair for each session according to the underlying encryption scheme. She sends over the ephemeral public key. Bob will pick yet another random message, an ephemeral message for this session, and he'll, uh, and he'll then T encrypt it with the ephemeral public key and send the resulting ciphertext over. And of course, we have to include this ephemeral transcript in the hash as well. So we'll include the ephemeral public key and ephemeral message and ciphertext. To sketch security rather quickly, I first make a statement that you will have to, to believe and the details can be found in the paper. So my claim is that with any non-trivial strategy the attacker could come up with, uh, they'll only obtain two out of the three messages that are used to derive the key. And given that this is the case, our AKE proof is basically a multi-user version of our CAM proof. Unless there's one exception, namely the aforementioned state reveal attack. So the problem cause is that Alice's state, namely the message she picks and the key pair she picks are independent of her secret key. And Bob's response, those two cipher texts, and the messages he picks are also independent of his secret key. So what the attacker can now do is to let Alice initialize the session that is to be attacked, to reveal her state, to learn the message MB, and then just to pretend uh, to be Bob by picking its own messages MA and MFemoral to control the whole key. But to succeed with this strategy, the attacker has to reveal Alice's session state before she refuses to communicate with Bob any longer, meaning that they have to get into the session state before she times out. Lastly, I want to discuss some open questions that I find particularly interesting. Uh, the first question concerns our correctness definition. Mm, you already saw in the discussion of the original Fujisaki Okamoto transformation, how um, active attackers can look for particularly bad ciphertexts to extract some information about the secret key, which is why we can't loosen this um, very conservative correctness notion in which we um, look at the worst message possible. And uh, yeah, maybe there's another way in which we can transition from, from um, average case correctness to worst case correctness generically. I think this would be quite neat. The second question is uh, whether there might exist passive to active transformations that are already starting from CAMS. I want to stress here that such a transformation is not even known for CAM to CAM. And, uh, yeah, it would be really great to have such a transformation because it would be applicable in authenticated key exchange and also when defining hybrid modes. With the latter, I mean um, combining um, classical secure and post-quantum secure schemes to hedge our bets when we want to uh, transition to, uh, towards post-quantum security. 
the last question I want to mention concerns the tightness of our results. Recall that on the comparison side for our known CCA bones, I already mentioned that Kurt et al. came up with a really cool, nice, uh, cool new um, quantum query extraction technique uh, resulting in way tighter bounds because they basically got rid of the square root that used to be inherent to all our extraction techniques. And um, what we might want to look into is whether this measure rewind measure technique can also be applied to our proof structure because it comes with some restrictions and we still have to make sure uh, that plugging our structure and the technique together indeed works out. But if that were to be the case, we would achieve tighter bounds for uh, both our CAM construction and our authenticated key exchange construction leading to greater efficiency. Um, with those questions, I want to conclude my talk. And yeah, thanks everyone for watching. I hope you enjoyed my talk. And uh, yeah, hopefully see you somewhere, somewhere. Bye.